Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Muslim CEO show. Today I have with me a legend, a legend in the flesh, mashallah tabarakallah. So before I get into it, I have brother Hamza Andreas Zorzis. Did I get it right? Be honest. Yes. Yes. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum rahmatullah. Wa alaikum rahmatullah. Okay, welcome to the show. So first of all, this is the place for you to learn from amazing people about leadership, about growth, because they've already been there, done it, and bought the soap. So today, <laughs> like I said, I'm really, really, really happy to have a very, very dear friend of mine and uh, someone who's a very huge inspiration to me. Um, his name is Hamza Zorzis. And you probably know him as a public speaker, he's an author, uh, he's a student, he's a da'i, he's a leader, he's a celebrity, he's basically everything under the sun. So first of all bro, Jazakallah khair, thank you so much for joining me, I'm really really honoured. You know, um, I've got to tell you Hamza, the first person I thought of when I thought about doing this show was you, right? And we're going to get into uh, why kind of I thought that and all the kind of stories because we've got a lot of history together, right? Yeah, we've absolutely. laughed together, we've cried together, we've done all kinds of things. So I'm really, really looking <laughs> forward to doing this with you. And I'm hoping I'm going to learn more about you, bro, that I haven't known before. Sure. Right? So before I do that, right, I want to ask you just a random question, which I didn't tell you about before, right? So I just want to ask you, what was Hamza like at 10 years old? Oh my god, what a question. Actually, that was probably a good time. It was before the bad times, I guess. So, and what I mean by bad times, not the, the intrinsically bad, but the way I perceive them, of course. So, Hamza, 10 years old, was someone who was loyal to his family, loved his mom and dad, saw his dad as a hero, was really good at school. And was overall a good kid. It was before I started to develop the experiences that basically facilitated quite a few inferiority complexes. <laughs> so it was a good time, bro. It's actually a really good question. I feel great about it because 10 years old was good. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> if you said 11 or 12, then that would be a different story. <laughs> do, you, do you remember what you wanted to be at 10? You know what? I think I wanted to be a doctor. I remember buying, or I think my mom bought it for me, or my dad bought it, to me, bought it for me. It was... <sighs> And it's like an encyclo- encyclo- encyclopedia. Hmm. It was called, I forgot what it was called, but it was about the human body. And I memorized a lot of the muscles in the human body in the Latin. Okay. I still remember them now. So, yeah. So I wanted to be a doctor. Amazing. Okay, great. So what I want to do is I want to go into your story a little bit, right? So I want you to give us a, a little bit of background, a little bit of overview for anyone that doesn't know you. Right, just a little bit of about you first of all, right? Um, because you have been blessed, and this is a huge blessing, I believe, Alhamdulillah, uh, to look like a Pakistani, but you're not actually a Pakistani, <laughs> right? Now, not many people get that blessing, but you do. So, just tell me a little bit about yourself for the people that don't know. Well, my name is Hamza Andres Zozis. I converted in 2002, in October 2002. I come from, I have a Greek background. My dad is, was born in Athens. He moved here in the 70s. My mom is a Greek Cypriot. She moved here in 1975 as a result of the Turkish Cypriot conflict. I was brought up in Hackney in the 80s mm. and 90s. And I went to college there. I started university studying let me see, what did I study? I studied, the first year I studied human physiology, then I moved to psychological sciences, then I did psychology. Then after a long gap, I did a postgraduate certificate in philosophy, and then I've done my MA in philosophy, and I'm continuing uh, postgraduate research in philosophy as we speak. I have kids, obviously I have a wife, I have a family, and I am now the... CEO of IERA, which is a global DAO organization that aims to basically reconnect humanity back to God, back to Allah. And the way we aim to achieve this is compassionately and intelligently. And we want to advance the prophetic mission, which is the mission of all the prophets, which is really telling people about who Allah is and who they are, that they have the truth already within them. And we want to just humbly and compassionately and intelligently awaken that truth within. So that's what we're about. We're currently in 
formerly, I think, in around more than 20 countries or in six continents. And uh, we have around 36 full-time outreach specialists all around the world. And the outreach specialist is basically a da'i, someone who calls people to Allah. And that has a specific role, but we could discuss that another time. Hmm. Okay, amazing. So one thing uh, I did recently is I came on to IRA. I had uh, the podcast with Musa. Right, and we were talking about you doing the podcast, right? And we were just saying that one of the things you'll realize when you first start out, uh, especially as a young person, is there are things that you will achieve in your life, inshallah, that you will never believe you could achieve. Right? Now, um, we talked about you because we were like, did Hamza ever imagine, like as a child, that this that he would be Muslim and that he would then go out and tell people about Islam and do all the great work you've done and do all everything you did with Ayra. Like, did you ever imagine that you would be Muslim or any of this stuff? Not really. But that's why I always say to people who writes the script. And I think the powerful thing about that, bro, is, is that there's always a new realm of possibility to achieve what you can. <laughs> but it's so true, isn't it? Because, you know, you don't really know the future. And if you plan, you should really plan your life in pencil because Allah's going to rub it out anyway and put mm. his plan in place. And I think it's uh, very important when you do look back into the past, you do it in an empowering way. You're thinking, wow, who writes the script? And you connect dots in a way that you never have even imagined. And, you know, I've had a lot of failures and a lot of mistakes, but I look back at them and I think, Subhanallah, if that never happened, I would probably not be here today. I would not be able to maybe empower others, inspire others, see things in other people they can't even see in themselves. Mm. It's because of all of these experiences. Like you have to really go through sometimes hell. You have to go into the ditches. You have to go into the gutter and positively respond to that in a way that is empowering so you can empower others as well. So, yeah, you're right, bro. If you spoke to the teenager Hums and said, you're going to be a Muslim, you're going to engage in da'wah, you're going to travel the world, you're going to eventually write a book, and then you're going to be the CEO of an organized global organization that is articulating Islam across the world, I would have thought, you better stop those drugs, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest. But yeah. It's not just about, you know, so-called big things like this. It's about anything in your life, bro. Even about being a father or hmm. being married or what do you mean? The, way you, the way you are as a parent, yeah? Hmm. Like, for example, before you're a parent, you're thinking, oh, I know what parenting is about. I know <laughs> what I'm going to feel. But the yeah. minute you experience it and you taste it, it's like, you know, the parenting, I get emotional when I talk about this. Parenting is like realizing you were in love before you were in love for example like Rumi the poet he once said you know true lovers don't fall in love they were already in love before they met like when I wow. see my daughter I'm like where have you been <laughs> like you felt something that was there you get my mm. point like I already loved you before you even existed I don't even know right so it's really powerful so the reason I'm mentioning this is because the experience transcends the concept sometimes because as you know there is a gap between what we know and who we become how we mm. relate to ourselves how we relate to others and if, and how we relate to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know to to become something to change our state of being you know you could conceptualize it all day but you have to taste it right so if i say to you what's your mother's cooking like you could tell me what the ingredient ingredients are you could tell me what to use in order to get the right curry or whatever the case may be and if i do it i'm not really tasting your mother's cooking I'm tasting my cooking, but to really taste your mother's cooking, I have to be invited to your mother's home and sit there and experience her amazing cooking. That's a different kettle of fish. Like you can see a picture of the famous picture of, of Michael, Michelangelo's picture, but if you're not there in the cathedral or the chapel, then, you know, it's a different story. So, you know, experiences, uh, I don't even know why, but how did I get here, bro? This is a typical Hamza thing to do. How did I get here? <laughs> can you remind me how I got here? <laughs> We just went but, on this journey. But, but it doesn't even but, matter. That's no, no, this, this, is, this is basically, you're talking about love, right? And you're talking about uh, experience and knowing, uh, basically. Yes. This is that you, you knew before, right? But this, this is all about you and who you would have been if it wasn't yeah, for Islam. Yeah, that's the case. Right? So when it comes to experiences, you, you know, uh, looking back into the past and seeing where I am now, sometimes experiences shape you as well from that point of view i don't even know how this is related to the previous point what was the point the point was would you have thought okay yeah that was it so w you are where you are now would you have ever imagined to be in this position that was the question yeah that we, yeah. we went on to this now, i don't know how it relates but it's useful anyway
Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> I, love what, I love what you said about the daughter. And I've got money that you're going to cry on this, so you better cry, bro. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, so tell me, bro, who's a leader that inspires you or that inspired you? Well, obviously, the first thing I would say is the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But I, I, I actually don't want to talk about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Not because he wasn't the best leader ever; he was the best leader ever. But I think, you know, I have to be true to my experiences because yeah. I think your leadership skills that you start to develop are when when you're growing up, and your parents have a huge role in that. So even before I was Muslim, I think I had some leadership skills. We all have leadership skills, by the way. I don't me- I don't, I'm not mentioning this as a, you know, an egotistical position. I'm saying, you know, we all have been given the key skills and the spark that's been nurtured by our parents. Mm. Um, and I think for me, the most inspirational leader, aside from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba, of course, and, and the famous scholars, is my father, right? Now, my father is not known, he's not really famous, which really is, is a true leader, because a leader should really lead from, behind, from, from the back, right? And my father, with all his mistakes, like we all make mistakes, he took a lot of leadership concerning moral leadership. And he took leadership concerning, you know, solving social problems within his family. And he did it in such a way that I felt was so empowering and so powerful. And, you know, he lived by example from that point of view. So, you know, my father was the kind of person that would stay awake in order for other people to sleep. My father is the kind of person that would starve in order, in order for, my, or for other people to, to eat. So, like, for example, my father had a business in the 1980s was called Miss Harris Fashions because my sister's name is Harris. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, in the 80s, the clothing industry in Britain was OK. But towards the mid 80s, I believe, or just after the mid 80s towards the late 80s early 90s the clothing business in the uk was actually hitting the floor because of it was cheaper in europe globalization all of these things right so there was a time where my father couldn't afford to take care of his staff and you know they and he realized they had families so from what i remember my dad telling me he made us eat potatoes for two weeks and i think he borrowed money just to pay his staff now, he could have basically um, got rid of his stuff like any businessman would. And that's why my dad says he's not a really good businessman because sometimes in business he says you have to be unethical, mm-hmm. which I don't believe to be the case. But, you know, case in point, the point is um, that that was his position. So, you know, things like that were very inspirational. Uh, other things that were inspirational, you know, my dad gave up all of his inheritance, you know, because there was fitna in his family and he took the blame for things. Mm-hmm. And that, that was really, really powerful. That is an act of moral and if not spiritual leadership from that point of view, yeah? So my dad was willing to take the blame, even if he didn't do things himself, willing to sacrifice his kind of um, social uh, well-being in order for others to basically have their own well-being from that point of view. And my dad would try and, you know, transcend his own shortcomings. Like, my dad is not a guy who likes hospitals. He's not a guy who likes nursing people. It's just not his thing to do. But his father... You know, was on his own in the village in Greece. He needed nursing. And my dad literally nursed my grandfather for three years. Mm. And that really inspired me. I said, hats off to my dad. I was like, because I know my dad, right? Those are the kind of things that he probably found really, really difficult. But you know what? He, he transcended his own uh, limitations, you know? Mm. Um, and my dad, in many occasions, he had an opportunity. He was homeless in the UK, I think, for the first six or nine months. Wow. He, had, he had an opportunity to steal or to do unethical things. But, you know, he, would, he wouldn't do that. And he would, he would basically try and stick to principle. And that has affected me to this date. Like things that I've tried to implement in this organization is because probably because of the inspiration of my dad. Because, you know, don't give up your principles to preserve them. In the long term, it's going to break you. Yeah. What do you mean and, by and, that? Don't give up your principles to preserve them. What do you mean? Well, for example, take for example, you know, certain nations, you know, take it from political level, we'll work our way down. Like, you know, certain mm-hmm. nations say, uh, you know, because of safety, we have to change our laws and our principles, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So before, if you had a liberal understanding of the rule of law and you don't want to spy on people, but now you're going to spy on people just, you know, for to, just, just to protect yourselves, right? Now, say there's a moral argument for that, but I'm not going to talk about the philosophy. The point is, you're breaking a principle to preserve your worldview. Um, now, even from, you know, an Islamic point of view, you know, are you going to break your principles just to preserve them? And my stance on this issue is no, because the whole, the reason for your existence is to be principled. 
Mm. So it's very self-defeating to break your principles just to maintain your existence. And this was like one of the moral dilemmas I believe Al-Ghazali uh, presented and he tried to address. And it's a similar scenario that you have in one of the Batman movies, right? You have two boats and you have criminals on one, you have good people on another. You know, which one do you kill? To, you know, who, what do you do? Do you mm. do the immoral thing or the lesser immoral thing for the good people to survive? Now, mm. I think Al-Ghazali's position on this, and I may be wrong, is that you don't do anything because your job is to be moral, mm. <laughs> right? Yeah. So obviously there are nuances even from the Islamic tradition, less of two evils, etc. But if you could hold on to your principles as much as possible, that is that is the way forward, you know. And I think this barakah and, and you, in the and future. You feel, you feel that your, your dad was the one that kind of showed you this properly. Yeah? Oh, absolutely. He he probably even teach it to me in words, and that's the great thing about leadership and teaching is that people don't listen; they they observe, mm. especially children. Children are never going to so listen true. to you anyway. Yeah. They just see, like if you say pray salah, pray salah, but you're not praying salah, game mm. over, right? If you yeah. if you tell children to pray and you're not praying yourself, mm. then they're going to learn through their eyes. And uh, I, I think that stays with us as adults as well, because mm. we have a hidden radar for hypocrisy, isn't it? We're like, hey, he's not doing it either. Mm. So, you know, I think that's why we need more transparency and more authenticity when it comes across you know, when we're public speakers, because it's okay to talk the talk, but you have to walk the walk as well. Uh, in real lived scenarios, you know, mm. I was mentioning this earlier. We're doing filming downstairs, and I was like, "Why was the Prophet Sallam one of the most was the a mercy to mankind?" Because you know, I could be like you know a monk, and I could teach you, "Thou must be the merciful, thou must be kind, thou must not curse and condemn." These are easy things to do. I could preach all day on social media, right? Mm. But when the proverbial hits the fan, where are you going? Well, you know, when you have a lived experience. So take for example the Prophet Sallam in the Battle of Uhud. Right when he had to defend himself and defend the people that he was leading, which included Muslims and non-Muslims, right? Mm. He had to defend them from people who were attacking them. And in the Battle of Uhud, they technically lost the battle. Mm. His Sahabi, his beloved companions, passed away. He was injured and he was bleeding, and it was the midst of battle. And the battle at that time it was very personal. It wasn't clicking a button, yeah. pressing a button, or, or or pulling a trigger. It's like swords and knives. You're very close. Yeah. So imagine the agitation of the instincts. You've been agitated, the survival instincts. Imagine you, you know, being afraid or, you know, all of these things. But the Prophet, and one of the Sahaba told him to curse them. And what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? In a time when he probably had justification to curse and condemn. But his response was this. I was not sent here to curse or condemn. I was sent here as a mercy. Mm. Oh Allah, forgive them for they do not know. Now that is mercy, right? Mm. You could be merciful yeah. in easy situations, but when your life is in danger, yeah. it's been in danger. You have the kind of psychological agitation of being in the midst of battle when, you, when your beloved companions have been passed away. How, how can you even respond that way? For me, it's just mm. unfun. Yeah, you it cannot is. comprehend, Absolutely. right? So yeah. this is why Islam, it, it has, the good thing about Islam, it has principles, but it also, a lot of the verses of the Quran are, Directly concerning lived experiences And that's why Islam changes your state of being Because the way to change your state of being Is actually applying principles to lived experiences And living them yourself And you don't have the example Then you don't know where, you, you, you don't know where you're going And mm. that's why sometimes people think You know, where are the nice rules in the Quran? X, Y, and Z You find them for sure yep. But a lot of the verses in the Quran Are based on lived experiences So you see yourself through that experience as well Which fundamentally changes you And that's why the Quran Has such a powerful transformative effect Because there are principles General principles as well Timeless principles But there are also teachings and lessons Applied to experiences So that's, ti that's why I always say You can never truly connect with the Quran it To a higher degree Unless you're living that experience yourself And that's why sometimes When you're in a certain state of being You're in a certain psychological state or experiential state Or you're, you're, you're in a certain social condition And you read those verses that apply to your condition It's like, wow, now I get it mm. Boom, yeah And that's why even one Sahabi He wasn't really connected to Allah His whole life changed When he read the, he heard the verse You know, isn't it time for the believers To be in awe of Allah From the remembrance of Allah That, that drastically changed him Because it applied to his lived experience mm -hmm. So that's why it's very important Always to read the Quran it always mm -hmm. do tadabbur on the Qur'an because the Qur'an is Allah speaking to you, isn't it? So if mm -hmm. you're not uh, engaged with the Qur'an on that, from that point of view, it's not going to change your state of being, which means how you relate you, to yourself, how you relate to others, and how you relate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, amazing. Anyway. Uh, that, that's great. I, I think this is definitely leading on nicely to 
uh, me understanding what is leadership for you. Like when I say leadership, when you hear leadership, what is it for you? What is it? Well, obviously leadership is many things in different contexts, but I'm obviously going to answer in that way, having a philosophical background. But generally speaking, I think leadership is getting the people that follow you to understand and internalize the vision and to prioritize the necessary actions in order to achieve that vision. And at the same time, empower the people that follow you to realize things in themselves they never realized before in order to fulfill that vision. And that, I think deep. that, and I think that is, I think that is generic enough <clears throat> to apply in any context. And that means you could lead from the front, you could lead from the back. It, it means so many different things. Hmm. Cause what I realized in my experience as CEO in IERA, which by the way, I didn't choose to become the CEO is forced upon me. Good. And which is really a, a well, you know, the Prophet Sallam said, whoever seeks his affair is not from us, right? From the point of view that you don't seek leadership. It's not, hmm. obviously there are contexts and sometimes you may have the skills, you know, to, to lead when your leadership is necessary and therefore there's a moral duty for you to lead. Hmm. But in this case, I, I actually didn't even believe I had the skills to be honest in the grand scheme of things. But you know what? Experiences make you. Sometimes experiences bring the best out of you, you know? Hmm. So, you know, when I was uh, uh, almost forced to become uh, CEO in I era, I realized that a lot of things that you need to do is see things in people that you can't see themselves. Um, and that gets you, it's moving when you see people, you know, have awakenings, like, they're like, wow, I didn't see that. I can't achieve that. Um, and that, that, that takes, I think that takes emotional and spiritual empathy. I think you have to have some kind of emotional intelligence to get that out of people. Um, for example, our fundraising manager, I remember, you know, Ira's fundraising situation wasn't the best. We were mm. doing relatively okay, but we had some old school methods. And at that time, about three or four, three years ago now, you know, we had a fundraising kind of assistant who was supporting the fundraising and marketing team. He was like, oh, bro, Hamza. And I wasn't CEO then. He was like, you know, this is the new trend, social media marketing. This is, this is you know, let's follow the data kind of thing. And he gave me some advice. He said, if you get me this training, I think we're going to do something good. I said, look, I'll try my best. I spoke to the CEO, mm. of, the, CEO, of, the time, CEO of the time. And there wasn't much buying. So when I became CEO, I actually trusted him. I trusted our fundraising. Now he's our fundraising manager. I trusted him. And I said, look, let's do this. So I had to convince the board for money to send him to Canada for training, to, you know, get him to understand social media fundraising and social media marketing, understand the algorithm. Uh, he already had a really good intuition about how to produce really good videos for fundraising. Anyway, to call it- how, how, how did you know, though, to trust him or not? Because that's a risk, right? You're going to go against what the board and everyone yeah, so wants. What? So what? So what? Well, if you don't take risks, what are you going to do? You must stay at home, man. You, the whole point of leadership is risks, bro. And, you know, you just have to trust what do you mean your intuition by that? sometimes. What do you mean by Look, that? It's okay, risk. so say I'm speaking to you and I want to get the best out of you, bro. All the signs you've given me is that you're a terrible, terrible, say, fundraising manager. That's all the signs you've given me. Mm. But I'm stuck with you. So what do I do? I see the great fundraising manager in you. Mm. I see the goodness in you. I'm like, you know what? He's a human being with two legs and two arms, so he could achieve what anyone else can achieve, right? Let's empower him to the degree that he could see that in himself and he could reach that. So that's what you have to do. You have to see that. Even if all the signs are like, you know what, this guy is not good enough, you have to understand even your own limitations because my perceptions of your incompetence is still my limited perceptions. Mm. It's based on my own limited yeah. drama. So I have to also understand, see, in understanding your own limitations, bro, you realize other people's greatness. Okay. To in understand understanding your own limitations, you realize other people's greatness. What do you mean by this, that? Okay, so I'm using my limited experience and limited understanding and limited intuitions and limited whatever, right? I'm imposing it on you because mm. all the signs I've seen so far and the way I've interpreted them from my limited experiences, limited knowledge, limited understanding is mm. telling me you can never be a fundraising manager, right? But I know their limitations. So what I need to do is divorce that drama I've created on you as a reality mm. and actually say, no, there can be a new room of possibility for this guy. Let me treat him as a blank canvas, right? He's a blank canvas. What do we do? I see the great fundraising manager in him. I think about what are the key things that he needs to become the fundraising manager, in, uh, uh, to become a great fundraising manager. And I push him to do that. And that sometimes mm. means encouragement. When you think, you know what, courage is never going to work. Well, how do you know? Try it, mm. right? 
So you encourage, you give people training, you inspire, you give people a vision. You almost say to them, I trust you so much, bro. I know you can get this done. And you create such an environment of psychology behind it that he starts to believe it in himself, even though that he thinks he doesn't know he can do it. Mm. And then when it happens, it will be the most empowering, empowering moment of his, of, of his life. He'll Amazing. be like, wow. So what like I I did, like, let me give you an example, bro. Yeah? Yeah, I, did the, I did the Dao course ages ago in Bolton or Blackburn. <laughs> and, you know, the, the Dao training course was a lot about empowering people. And alhamdulillah, you know, a lot of credit goes to you for developing that model because mm -hmm. you're all about empowering others. May Allah bless you, right? Mm -hmm. So when there was a sister in the corner of the room and I used to choose the people that would look vulnerable and look like they couldn't speak. What's the point of getting people to speak when they mm -hmm. could ever really speak? There's no point. So I said, right, you stand up and you go through the whole method. And I'm telling you, bro, she was like shaking. She was stuttering. She couldn't do it. She's trying to read the book. I said, put the book down, the booklet, put the book down. She failed, bro. And I'm thinking, oh my God, if I leave her here now, I'm finished. I mean, she's finished. It's gonna, it might, it might scar her for the rest of her life. So we tried it again. Didn't work. Bro, I'm telling you, yeah. I had to have faith. I said, I know you can do it. You can do it better than me. And I'm telling you, all the signs were, forget it, mate. Tell it to go home. Kind yeah. of thing. I think we did it six times, bro. Wow. And I'm telling you, on the sixth time, it was, it was beautiful. It's like I shocked myself as well. I was like, wow. And she did it almost better than me. Would you believe it? And I was like, I told you. And it was so inspirational for everybody else. Because mm. now they saw themselves in her. She had a lived experience. She fell on the floor six times or around that number, if you like. And she bounced back up and she did it better than she could ever imagine. I said to mm. her, didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you you could do this and you didn't know? Right? So this is another like kind of small example to bring that point home. What, what I love about this, bro, is that when we think about leadership normally, we think, we think about the vision of the world and the way the world is, but you're saying that you, can, that you can have a vision for your people and you having those high standards will actually create an amazing result as long as you believe. Look, at the end of the day, bro, look, we believe in our vision as in Ayur, right? We believe a world reconnected to Allah, a world reconnected to God, and we have a specific strategy a strategic focus, a set of actions that, that we have to adopt in order to achieve that. We may be wrong. <laughs> mm. We may have to change our vision or our strategic focus in the next three to five years. Who's going to do that for us, bro? It's going to be people. So why don't you develop people better than you to make better decisions? Because mm. sometimes I think in leadership, we think this vision is static and the strategic focus is static. It mm. could be. Don't get me wrong. You could yeah. have it for the next 50 years. But you know what? You have to also have some kind of epistemic humility and leadership humility, humility to understand, you know what? We may develop people to the point that they develop a better vision and they create a better strategy for us. But how, how do and, I get over that? So there's this guy who I basically trained and taught and I taught him everything he knows. He was a butcher. He knew nothing. And now he's like becoming this amazing guy and he's getting famous. How do I deal with that? Like with my ego and my internal working, you know? Well, ego's the enemy. I was reading, yeah, uh, listen, listen to, yeah, yeah, brilliant. Ryan Holder, audio book. Yeah. yeah, he's brilliant. He's amazing, brilliant. But yeah. he's, he's like a you know stoic philosopher, if mm. you like. And stoicism, yeah, the stoic approach is very similar to Islam in many ways, yeah. but that's a different discussion. So, how do you keep your, how do you keep your ego in check as a leader with all these kind of things? Because what you're saying basically is that if you believe in this person, if you help this person, if you have this vision for the, this, is all about the other person. This is like yeah. putting my ego to the side. Well, that's so what leadership you... that's what leadership's about. <laughs> it's not about you really, it's about other people. So how do you do that? Like let's say my ego's slightly bigger than it should be, like how do I get it to that point? Well, I think there's a few things. You first you have to realize that. So you have to have that awakening. Mm. You have to understand that the ego is a barrier to success. Mm. And you understand that rationally intellectually, but you also realize from an Islamic point of view, it's a barrier to divine grace and mercy and barakah. And you have to also create an environment within yourself that keeps your own ego in check. So say, for example, in our era, we've created, I've made finance above me in some quasi way, yeah, that I, I like fear them. <laughs> literally, <laughs> literally, like, you know, I, I have, we have a governance policy, I'm allowed to, you know, spend money onto our charitable objects and, and, you know, all of these things. But, you know, for example, any contract that's done, finance have to co-sign. What does co-sign mean? It basically, they do any kind of external audit check. Mm -hmm. Is there any conflicts of interest? Did he really make the right decision? Not only that, 
we have like multiple levels of authorization now that no one can even make an accusation of mismanagement of funds by virtue of the process because I'm getting checked left, right and center. Mm. Now that keeps me in check, right? So that's an example of creating an environment that keeps yourself in check. Mm. Even when I make decisions. So I offered a subcontractor, say a certain amount, it was 300 pounds more than I should have technically, right? It was within the kind of limit, but I gave him 300 pounds what someone thought I should have given him per month. I even shook hands. The following day, I get lumbasted. I'm like, nope, we're not doing this. The kind of thing, they'll go straight to the board. They'll, 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 they'll basically take me to account. Mm. To cut a longer story short, I had to retract. I had to apologize to the guy. I said, I made the wrong decision. I've, I've been taken to account by my control team, if you like. Um, and they have the authority to do that. So this is what we have to do. So you create an environment as well to try and suppress your ego. So you, you create principles that you believe in and you know they're true, even from a spiritual and even from a professional point of view, um, that people could take you to account and it's relatively transparent from that point of view. So you can never say, would you know I'm the CEO? How dare you I'm the CEO? That, that should never happen uh, in any leadership context. In actual fact, if someone takes you to account, you should love it. I mean, mm. the other day we we're having a conversation, you know, in the staff meeting with the operations manager and she basically, uh, she won the argument. And then I had to say, this is exactly why we hired you. Well done. And that's it. So look, for me, obviously, I don't want to secularize the discussion. So, and I'm not saying I don't have an ego, by the way. Yeah. Everyone has an ego, especially mm. me. But I think you need to, uh, we need to realize that the ego, the nafs or kibber, arrogance and ego are related in Islam are a barrier to success. And we need to understand something that shaitan is our teacher in this regard because shaitan teaches us how not to be. Mm. So when Allah tells shaitan to bow down to Adam, how does he respond? He says no. So he denies the ultimate authority. He thinks he knows, right? So he always wants to be right, never wants to be wrong, Mm. right? And he does want to bow down. Essentially, he wants people to bow down to him. So he he doesn't want to be imposed upon. He wants to impose. And he says, I'm fire, he's clay. He wants to look good, he doesn't want to look bad. This is the kind of nature of the nafs, the nature of the ego. Mm. So, look, obviously there's nothing wrong in wanting to look good and wanting to be right and not yeah. wanting to be imposed upon, for sure. But if it's at the detriment to being true to yourself and true to Allah, then that's excessive, that's the ego. Mm. For example, I always say to people, give up your right to being right, but be true to yourself. Because it could be by being true to yourself, you realize you were wrong. It could be that by being true to yourself, you realized that actually I shouldn't have done this. I need to look bad. I need to apologize. I need to basically say that that I was wrong. I need to do a retraction. It could be that being true to yourself and fundamentally being true to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you should allow others to impose the opinions and their structures on you, not the other way around. Because you're being true to yourself and true to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you notice in you an excessive kind of desire to always want to be right, never want to be wrong, an excessive desire of always wanting to impose, never wanting to be imposed upon, mm. an excessive desire to always want to look good, never want to look bad, then that's the nature of the ego. So once you understand that, you need to keep yourself in check. And mm. you need to have very good people around you that can keep you in check. Um, and I believe someone who doesn't have a mentor, who doesn't have scholarly types around you, that's a very dangerous person. That person should never take leadership ever. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the wonderful things I saw from you, actually, that um, there was opportunities that came your way and you were like, yeah, I think I should do this. And then you were like, no, I'm not going to do this. And I was like, bro, why are you doing it? Well, Sheikh saying so-and-so said that I, he doesn't think it's good for me, so I'm not going to do yeah. it. Yeah. Right. So this is this is really, really amazing to be able to like take that advice and stuff. So tell me, what, what's the relationship between leadership and dawah? What, what's the relationship? Well, in, in the grand cosmic scheme of things, everyone's a leader based on the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu mm-hmm. Alaihi Wasallam that, you know, we're a shepherd. You know, we may be leading a community, we may be leading a family, we may be leading d- different areas of our life. But look, the connection between leadership and da'wah is essential because, you know, the, Allah, uh, the, Prophet, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the, uh, the mercy of Allah, the hand of Allah rather, the hand of Allah is over the jama'ah, right? So mm. success lies in bringing a group of people together. Now, as you know, you know, if there's more than two people, then they require an emir. Mm. Uh, by virtue of that, if you're in a jama'ah, if you're an organization, if you're, if, you're, if, if you're a vehicle, a collective of people in order to re- reach a certain dawah vision uh, with dawah, dawah objectives, yeah. then by virtue of that, bro, you need leadership. You need a leader. 
So leaders are absolutely necessary. Absolutely. But leadership in some is very holistic. You know, it's not only, you know, strategically thinking you have to put A, B, C in place to achieve X, Y, and Z. No, it's also basically a leader has to be as best as possible, egoless as possible, connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mm-hmm. be willing to be taken to our account, be willing to be challenged, not having yes people around you. In actual fact, the people around you, you should not like, to be honest. And what I mean by don't like is obviously you love them, you care for them, but you know, they always agitate you, mm. you know, uh, and it's good. They take you to account because you know you need that in order to be uh, the best leader possible. And that means you need a vision for yourself and you need to understand what are the key actions and what's the environment that I require in order for, for, for me to fill that that personal vision that's in line with the greater vision that you have for your organization. So you have to structure that. So, you know, there's a lot of principles in place that you, you, you have to adopt, which are all Islamic principles, of course. Take Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu an, when he was taken to account and he was happy with that, hmm. right? And he even ch- put, uh, checked his own nafs when, you know, his nafs whispered to him that he was somebody great, but he, he stood on the pulpit and he started basically degrading himself, right? Because he knew that was a barrier to his success. Also to understand that, you need to work behind the scenes and do a lot of private deeds, not only for your ikhlas, but just basically, you know, lead, leading from the behind. Mm. Um, so, for example, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an would see, would see uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu an. You know, when Abu Bakr was the leader, he was the khalifa. I think he was, correct me if I'm wrong, it was, he was milking the goats of an old woman and cleaning her house. Mm-hmm. This is when he was khalifa. Because look, the early pious predecessors, they knew that all of your public actions are probably not going to be accepted. That's, that's how they understood ikhlas. Really doing things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Doing it for the fact that he's worthy of the act, that they, lo- that they love him. Doing it for his reward and doing it to prevent themselves from the nar, from the punishment. This is what ikhlas really means. You could do it for any of those reasons, but the ulama say it's best to do it for all of those reasons. And they understood to develop your own ikhlas, you go do private deeds. Mm. And this links to... Leading from the behind as well, because, you know, sometimes leaders think, you know, oh, you know, I go on social media, I got to do more, I got to do more debates, more essays, more articles, I got, I got to be in the limelight. But I realized, actually, if you want to fulfill your vision as an organization, you have to empower others to be like that. And that's why when I was developing, uh, we were delivering a course, I was saying to people, who made dua, who made supplication to Allah that these people become better than you? If not, then you've got the wrong end of the stick. Mm. You need to believe that people that you're developing and training far surpass you. You know, they yeah. become much better than you. It's like the story, I think you told me this story, the story of the cook. It took him 20 years to develop this amazing cake or something mm. and it took him 20 minutes to teach his disciple. Yeah. Now that disciple is going to be a far better cook because he's already got 20 years experience in 20 minutes and now he's mm. going to move forward. And this is, this is the art of leadership. The leaders shouldn't really be seen per se. And that's why leadership should be managed by exception, I think. As best as possible. Obviously, the context varies, but what do I mean by manage by exception? Is that you empower, get people to do the great work, and if they fall, pick them up. If there's any gaps, fill the gaps, and then create people to fill the gaps after you filled them, uh, mm. which is very important. So manage by exception. You know, trust people, empower them, get them to see things in themselves that they couldn't see in themselves. If there's any issues, that's when you get involved, mm. and you do it in a way that doesn't disempower them. So, right? what, what about? A leader dealing with leaders, right? So, for example, a lot ah, of the brothers and sisters, a, a lot of brothers and sisters who are in your position. I speak to a lot of CEOs, right, and they find it very difficult to deal with the board because they have this vision of how things should be done, what should be done, and then a lot of the people, you know, they're different to, I guess, the IRA board where there's a lot of old school people who don't really know so much about how life is today and stuff, and so they struggle because they're like, this is where I want to take the organization, but those guys are over there. I'm a leader of all my people. How do I then deal with these guys who are my leaders? Well, to be a good leader, you have to be a good follower. I think I've realized that because even I had my own internal issues concerning the board. Mm -hmm. But then I realized, hold on a second. In order to be a good follower, you have to ask yourself the question, how do I make my leaders better? It's so easy to moan and groan. You know, ah, the guy doesn't know much Quran or he's not pious Mm. enough. Why is he leading? Get lost. He's probably got ikhlas better than you. He's probably got better leadership skills than you. And Allah saw something in him, in him that, you, that, you, that you can't even see in him, right? So you need to ask yourself the question, how do I make my leaders better? That's the art of a good mm, follower. And if you're not okay. a good follower, you can never lead in my view. Mm. So the minute you understand, right, it's about me wanting things to work. 
And if it's about wanting things to work, then you don't care if you have to be patient, if you have to spend 50 minutes on one point, if you have to repeat yourself, you have to justify it to the nth degree, you have to do another research paper just to justify, you know, a certain thing that you want to do. You mm. want things to work. So just get it done. So in and a way, you're, same, you're, you're, saying same, that, yeah. you're saying that, because that, we know that leaders have responsibility, but you're yes. kind of saying that even followers have a responsibility. Of course they do. Absolutely. Apart the from following. Can, yeah, well, read Kitab al-Amara in the Hadith books, right? In one of the Hadith books. You know, you have to obey the Emir, right? So you have to, even if you don't think someone's competent, that's probably your own limitation because you haven't seen greatness in them. Look, you, it's all right by saying, you know, I'm a leader, there's people underneath me, and I'm going to see things in them that they can't see in themselves and empower them. Hmm. Well, you, the door swings both ways, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you need to do that with your own board. Hmm. So you need to empower your board and see things in your board that you've never seen um, in them before and actually, you know, help them achieve the vision that they have for themselves. And it, and it works, bro. And it works. I've had, you know, the board have been so kind to me. Alhamdulillah. Sure. You know, obviously, I get taken into account, which I should yeah. do. And, you know, the board have, you know, very good skills. Everyone has skills in their own particular area, for sure. And I've learned a lot from the board. And it just improved our board meetings. And if you have the mindset, on, mindset of, it's not about me. It's about getting things working. It's about doing the best for the organization because you believe in the vision. It's about having no ego because of the barrier to connecting with them and, make, and, and, and getting the best out of the situation. And it's also seeing in them what they can't see in themselves mm -hmm. and asking yourself the question, how do I make the board the best board possible? And if you do ask yourself that question sincerely, then you're going to make a great board. You can advise them privately. You could share documents. You could basically create a governance policy in place that facilitates better decision making. You know things that we've been doing in our era, for example. So that's it. So you, mm. you just say, you know, and and you need to basically make the board very special. If you're the kind of uh, leader that says, you know, the board this, the board that, and you know, you get upset and you express it a lot. You know, sometimes, sometimes, you know, I've expressed frustration, but Hamza the board, board have been so kind and so and so they have great leadership. But some people do that, isn't it? So uh, my view is you should always, within your team, show that the board are like you know amazing and they're mm. brilliant, yeah, yeah. Um, because that creates a really good ethic in the organization. Because and it also shows that there's someone above you. So I've tried to make the brothers and sisters in our era think they could go straight to the board to challenge me, right? If if we're at loggerheads on something, like finance could go straight to the board and say, mm -hmm. I don't think Hamza's using money appropriately. Yeah, and they could just get me in trouble. And you deliberately create those kind of structures, and you elevate the board like that—that that they have the authority, and they do have the authority anyway. Especially from a charity point of view, that they have the ultimate kind of authority from that point of view. But you instill that in your followers. Hmm. So it's not all about you; it's me, and whatever I say is right. No, you make them realize that I got someone above me too, and ultimately, above us is Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, right? Mm -hmm. So that's very important to instill Amazing. in people's hearts and minds. I think um, one thing I want to share, there's, there's a quality, two, three qualities, mashallah, that I've seen in you, right? But to demonstrate, I want to tell you that um, when I first started with Aira, you were already part of Aira, right? It was the really early days, today on the Dixie Queen, those kind of days, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. And I remember that I came to one of the early, early events and Saki was introducing me to everyone, right? And I remember I met a lot of different people on that night. But the one I remembered of all was you. Because when you met me, you met me completely different. You know, you, know, you meet people every day and, and that I'm meeting people, meeting people. Salam alaikum, salam alaikum. And when I met you, you were like, oh, Muhammad al-Rashid. And we've never met. We've ne like, we probably haven't even heard of each other, right? And you were so warm and you were so authentic. And you were like, I'm so looking forward to uh, working with you. And that whole time, I remember it right now, like it's just happened. I remember we were in a car park after some sort of a live appeal that you had done and stuff like that. In Waltham still, yeah. Yeah, and, and it was amazing. It was an amazing experience for me to just meet you. And so I really want to understand, like, what is it that drives that authenticity, that warmth, that expression that a lot of brothers, especially males, don't kind of go to that level. So where, where does that all come from? You know, I don't really know. Probably my dad, by the way I was brought up. But I think for me, if I want to retrospectively philosophize about it, yeah, I think for me it is meaning. It's, it's, there's no meaning behind being fake, bro. And for me, I've always been driven by meaning. And that's because of my negative experiences of childhood. Not that my parents did anything bad, but it was my perception of certain events. Yeah. And the, those were like landmark moments, if you like, that really made me perceive the world in a different way. So... 
and and for me, I was chasing meaning, um, and because meaning means that something is grounded bigger than you, right? So you, the the thing that you're doing, or the action, or the activity, or the way you are, is grounded in something bigger than you, right? And for me, if you didn't have that, then it becomes meaningless. And I think being fake and not authentic is meaningless because it's not grounded in something bigger than you. It's actually just your ego sometimes or your own limitations. So I think for me, a lot of it is about meaning. I know that sounds really but, weird. No, that is weird. But one on yeah. one level is very good because you're saying authentically you're going to be yourself. Okay. But what I'm saying is that one of the but things... But you're not that... always yourself. There is a context that we act, of course. But yeah. look, the way I came across to you is what... You know, generally speaking, I like to be an outgoing character. I like to, you know, treat people nicely and, you know, engage and always see good in people, that kind of thing, right? But at the same time, to make a decision not to be like that is meaningless for me because uh, it's inauthentic and it's not grounded in something bigger than myself. No, I don't, but, but I don't, there's, a sec- I, I, there's a secondary point here, right? Which is that one of the things that people really love about you, Mashallah Tarakullah, is that the way you express yourself. Okay, so one level is like I'm saying authenticity, the warmth was very good, but I'm asking you about the expression where you can actually express yourself on a much better level because that was part of it. It wasn't just that you said nice, it was just the way you express yourself. So, you know what, in in retrospect, maybe this whole meaning thing doesn't make any sense. So, you're right, but I don't know how meaning fits into it. Okay, but but tell, feel, tell me about your expression feel, like why, yeah, why, how, how is it that yeah. you're able to express yourself to brothers and how is it that you're uh, able sure. to bring yeah. yourself out like that i do feel the the meaning thing has a context but maybe not in this particular context it's more about being authentic with yourself i don't find that meaningful that's what i'm trying to say because if you're authentic with yourself then you're more likely to be authentic with others and the way mm. you come across is not going to be basically a, just a facade that kind yeah. of thing yeah um, so how you know what I think a lot of it is not really caring what people think. <laughs> that's that's one thing, right? And caring a lot what people think is probably a sign of an ego. Um, that's one thing for me. Not really care. And what I mean by not caring what people think, you care about people's feelings, but you're not you, who you are is not contingent, is not dependent on people's perceptions, like or expectations. So you try and transcend that in the way. Yeah, and from the Islamic point of view. You know, we should always ask the question: What does Allah want from me in this situation? Not what does He want from me? What does Allah want from me? So, if you, if if what Allah wants from you is something that someone doesn't like, then who cares, right? Mm. Uh, do you see the point? So that's what I mean. So you transcend social pressure from that point of view. Um, and I saw it in my father. You know, he would really be himself. He was like a hippie type of Greek, vegetarian, right? Mm. Um, have all these ideas that were not in line with a kind of you know Greek culture that he was brought up in in the 1950s, 60s. So, you know, it's, you know, I saw that in my father a lot. So I think I'm just an ex, an, a protraction. I'm an extension of what, my, what I was brought up with, in, uh, you know, how my father was interacting with other people. Um, and you know what? You want to treat people how you want to be treated, isn't it? Yeah. So I always saw people around me, like my father, my mom, maybe family, mm. having that passion, having that self-expression. And you, you just learn to like it and you learn to appreciate it as authentic. And basically, you, 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 you know, to, if you're sincere to yourself, that you want to treat others that way as well. So, Amazing. Look, you know, I think a lot of it is cultural, bro, you know, honestly. A lot of our Muslims, unfortunately, they come from an Asian subcontinent background. And they probably haven't had the experience that I have. And I don't mean that in an arrogant way because there's many great parents in the Asian subcontinent community. But mm. generally speaking, you know, we're going through post-colonial trauma, bro. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and it's affected our psychology. You know, we have a bit of an inferiority complex, the way we come across. Um, generally, in some cultures, you know, I've, I've asked some of the brothers from that community, they said, have you ever heard your father say he loves you? Mm. That's that. And they said, no, and never. Yeah. Now, obviously, the father does love of them. Course. But, you know, yeah. you got to hear it, bro, as well. And, and, and you got to connect it with action. Mm. And, and subhanAllah, when I hear things like this, I'm thinking we've got a lot of work to do in our community. Yeah? A lot of the issues that we suffer are actually psychodynamic. Mm. And what I've realized... Brothers and sisters with good relationship with their parents, they are different type of characters. And I've seen that. I've actually seen that. In what way? What way are they different? Well, I think they are more positive. They're more outgoing. They're more Mm. self-expressive. They're less defensive, I think, in some cases. Uh, They're more likely to probably uh, to apologize, to have great emotional intelligence. Mm. And, you know, and and that's it. And that's why parenting is so important. Now, don't get me wrong. Just because you've had that background, there's no excuse, right? But you just have to realize that. And just create awakenings within yourself and basically be the person you want to be. You know, we all have different backgrounds um, and we all have our own challenges. And there shouldn't be excuses for why we are 
who we are now because we can always transform. Well, that's, that's a good point about background and transformation because a lot of people will see you today, bro, and, you know, people have been watching your videos and debates and all this kind of stuff, right? Um, and they're thinking, this guy was born with it. Like, you know, nah, nah. he's just he's just someone who just got the lucky thing of being able to speak and, you know, he's just done it. Like, can you tell me a little bit about failures, bro, in your life? Yeah, tell me a little about, like, so, your first experiences. and. So I think, look, I think what one should have is a sense of conscientiousness, right? That doesn't mean they're a good person, that they could reflect. They have an ability to self-reflect and to be mm-hmm. self-aware to some degree. That is pretty... If there was any skill I would try and teach someone, it would be that. Because if you don't have that, then it's very hard for you to transform at all. Yeah, You're always blaming others. You won't find the real causes to things. So let me give you an example that we both shared. Yeah, So I remember when I was in the dawah, and you know what? Oh my God, you know, a lot of it was ego, bro, as you can imagine. You know, I'm the first kind of uh, da'i in, in, in the public sphere when social media was just about to get popular, mm-hmm. yeah. right? 2006 2007 that kind of era youtube facebook twitter that kind of stuff right and i didn't know how to do with it i didn't have scholars around me to do with this properly so what am i thinking i'm thinking just do the work and you know a lot of it was getting platform getting popular and you know the whole concept of the class was in the background you know it was it was it was almost now thinking about a spiritually traumatic experience yeah and i remember one time in our era i was invited to chicago to do this tour and there was a beautiful bunch of brothers that basically had a massive kind of smackdown on me. There was one particular brother who's, who maybe basically made me feel that everything I'm doing is pointless. It was like, mm. you're doing a lot of stuff, but you're just a rocking chair. A rocking chair moves a lot, but it's not going anywhere, right? So it made me feel like a rocking chair. It made me feel that, you know, I'm not doing anything with any ikhlas, with any sincerity, because it's about me and about, you know, I'm running the show. So he really just created an awakening within me. I remember in this room that we're in now, it was me and you in the meeting. I remember yeah, and I started crying, and I was, I remember, I was, I nearly made you cry that day, yeah. I remember, that's the first time I nearly made you cry, I was really crying, I was like, oh my god, what have I done, I've done nothing, it's a pointless, mm. uh, you know, no class. and I remember I made a decision, and obviously I didn't get it perfect straight away, but I made a decision from that point, everything that I do, I try and link it to empowering others, and developing others, and training, and you know what, that one experience has actually fundamentally changed our era, Mm. Because from there, yeah. it helped develop uh, courses, different courses that we started to do, um, other than the, 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 the primary course that we were doing. Then that was the basis for our education pathway now at the moment that thousands of people have engaged with um, in, to, to a certain degree. Mm. Um, and yeah, so, and it was the basis for the book. Well, like, you would never imagine. So one negative experience, look what's happened kind of thing, right? Mm. And, you know, and that's why, you know, I think it was... Uh, Sheikh Abu Abdus Salam, he, when I was going through like a really bad period, he was like, look, man, on the day of judgment, you would wish for this to happen a thousand times because you're going to look back and say, subhanAllah, this helped me with my humility. This helped me with my ikhlas, with my sincerity. This helped me with who I am today, those negative experiences. Mm. So, yeah, so that was uh, one, 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 one learning curve. Uh, another learning curve was to basically, you know, you have to realize that the Tao is bigger than you. Yeah. Oh, it's not. It's not about you. And you have to apologize sometimes. You have to retract. You have to move forward. Um, and you know, you have to make po- uh, positive changes. I think that's very important to understand that the Tao is much bigger than you. Another thing I think I realized was sometimes I would get really, really emotional. Like I think one of the board members who was a bit reluctant to ask me to become the CEO, I believe, because he thought I reacted very emotionally, like a very kind of mm. Greek way. You know, we break plates at weddings, we're very passionate. We're like the yeah. European Punjabis, bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? So uh, from that point of view, it was like, you know, and I've learned now to control that in some degree. Mm to actually focus more on getting things to work rather than reacting to my initial gut feeling about, oh my God, I don't believe this is happening kind of thing. And I've learned that as well uh, throughout, you know, me being a leader from that point of view. Mm. Um, yeah. So t- uh, oh, t- and, and I've realized as well, with leadership in Islam, you, you, have to, you have to focus on the inner dimensions of your worship. You have to focus on dhikr and athkar to protect yourself. You can't be just a normal Muslim. From that point of view, you have to try your best to try and, you know, connect with Allah. Because without Allah's help and connection, you're finished. Mm. You're finished. I think I think there's one big area that I haven't talked about right now, bro, is that, uh, mashallah, you know, 
you've shown real leadership, bro, with with atheism, you know. Um, and I think this is so important because, you know, we're, we were going through a place where a lot of people like, you know, going to university, having to deal with Islam on this level, not understanding Islam properly. Um, and, you know, this thing that you've done with atheism is, is really truly inspiring. Bro. It's one that, you know, like it, it makes me feel so happy to have you in our ummah, alhamdulillah. Like imagine if you were on the other side, bro, may Allah protect us, right? Yeah, I mean. So... Um, I think that this real thing was huge leadership. So just tell me a little bit about yeah, like, well, what drove that. Yeah, well, to be very that, honest, like... bro, uh, look, let's be very honest. I wrote this in the preface to the book that a lot of it was tried and error in the beginning because in the beginning, I was just basically emulating and almost plagiarizing and copying mm. Christian philosophers, right? Because, you yeah. know, I was so passionate about Islam. I was so passionate about uh, spreading what I believed to be true that the, the, the next best, best thing that I had, we didn't have anything in, in, in Islamic literature. I was like, well, this is a Christian. He believes in God as well. He's doing great work. So I would emulate him a lot. And then that's the first stage of, of actually trying to discover yourself and your own positions by emulating other people sometimes, mm. right? Um, so, and I did a lot of mistakes in that. Some mythological mistakes, absolutely. And mm. maybe I spoke about things that I didn't have correct sound knowledge on, right? Yeah. You may say there's excuses, there wasn't much people around me, you didn't have scholars or books in the English language. But look, it's not like all of a sudden I'm a great leader in atheism. No, it was like trial and error, did a lot of mistakes. But there was a period where I started to realize, look, we need to be more true to the tradition. And I think that's one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book as well. To, to, so it doesn't, so, because I felt there was nothing in the English language that was in-depth enough to actually solve a crisis that we had in the English speaking audience. Yeah. Mm. So maybe if anything was leadership was basically writing the book. But the funny thing is, I didn't even think of writing the book. It was Tarath Publishing came up to me and they wanted to do, create a sub publishing for uh, like, like a sister publish publishing uh, group for students or something. And they asked me to write the book. It was actually originally done because someone asked me to do it, mm. even though I probably didn't have the right knowledge. And I, and, you know, it's so true that one person said the greatest book that you would engage with or write or the greatest book that you would engage with or read is your own book. Because mm. I learned a lot just writing a book. It was a three year journey for me. Oh. So uh, to cut a long story short, we had uh, we, we uh, the objectors were not in line, uh, aligned because they wanted it to be very excessively academic. I think I wanted it to be for the first or second year university student. So they said, you know, Keep on doing it, but do it for someone else kind of thing from what I remember. Um, and then after I found a publisher and, 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 and I did the book. So I think if anything, the good thing that I did was probably write the book. But that was as a result of my negative experiences from refining the arguments, trial and error. You know, I had debates with many academics, some of the greatest academics in the world, like Professor Simon Blackburn from, uh, from Cambridge. Um, obviously, you had Lawrence Krauss, but you know, you know what I mean. So we yeah. had all these debates, and a lot of these debates, I made mistakes too. But you learn. So I think for me, um, it wasn't an easy road, bro. It's not as if, oh, look at this guy; he's really bright. You know, I just finished uh, postgraduate philosophy relatively recently. It's not as if I already had it, right? Mm. So, so where did, where, did, where, did you, where did you find the courage, bro? Because you know, you were going against like scientism and Darwinism and all these things, which are like seen as certain truths, and then here's this. You know, Muslim guy who's standing up and starting to talk about these things. Where do you get the courage for something like that when you don't actually have a degree in this stuff and you don't really know it so deeply? Where does the like the courage come to to do that? Oh, I don't know. Is it courage? Is it ego? I don't know, bro. Maybe it's a bit of both. But may Allah protect us. But, but I mean, the thing in, is, in the sense that you know, you got you got slated a lot of uh, times yeah, online time. by all yeah, these because yeah, yeah. they have a whole load of. But hundred uh, about look, I think the good thing is now is that. The good thing that my father tried to give me, and he even mentioned this as well, was try to be self-aware and have conscientiousness. So I had a lot of experiences. Some of them were negative, And hopefully I was conscious enough to analyze them and improve. And that, and the book is a result of that. And the training courses were a result of that. And hopefully we've tried to shape a narrative and help others. So there are future stars in the Ummah now. Look at Subur, man. Subur Ahmed. Like, I could never imagine, right? Uh, him being able to basically mm. articulate himself this way, especially yeah. in the philosophy of science uh, uh, with regards to evolution. But this is this is what it's about. It's not about mm. you anymore. And I remember in 2015, Sabur, I told him to come with me to Lebanon. Yeah, it was almost like a holiday. I was the head of education at that time, I believe. And I was like, right, read this old article I've written on evolution, right? Mm. I tried to take leadership. It's not even a really great article. The concepts are really good. But yeah. generally speaking... 
it's nothing like, oh yeah, this is great. Yeah? But the concepts are quite profound. I said, read it. So he read it. He was like, okay, this is good. And then he bought some books. Then he started mm. researching. Then he put things together. Then he started developing. Then he went back to uni. Then he created a group of academics around him to empower him. Then he moved forward. Then he started having debates. And look at him now within what, four years? Four years, mm-hmm. probably one of the only reference points, uh, one of what one out of five reference, five reference points that we have in the ummah at the moment in terms of academics and leaders dealing with this particular topic, you know. So this is the people that you want to facilitate, mm. and uh, yeah, and even though the thing that you probably did wasn't that great, it was you know wasn't perfect, but it's something that helped inspire someone, and that's that's the art of leadership, mm. and the art of leadership as well is people learning from your own mistakes as well. That you don't let people reinvent, you know, the mistakes. Uh, and that's why, you know, it's very important to, uh, I don't know, I think I'm waffling now. But the point is, bro, I don't think it's all that glamorous that, you know, hey, I was the guy and dealing with atheism. But did, did there was you a never, lot of mistakes, a lot of mistakes. Did you not feel like ever just like giving it up? Did it never get too much Oh, for of you? course it did. Absolutely. So how bro. come you're still here? Well, ultimately, everything is because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's for sure. Uh, if it wasn't without him, wouldn't be anywhere or do anything or be able to say anything. So it's all as a result of the will of Allah. And you know, you know, there's a separate Greek saying, right? You have skulugui. Skulugui is a worm. There's a little worm that eats at you, right? You got to do this stuff, right? <laughs> and you have a passion, bro. You know, the existential mm-hmm. philosophers would say, if you're not passionate, then you can't really live a good life. And passion doesn't mean expressing passion, but at least you have that internal fire, that internal passion. So. And for me, it fundamentally boils down to meaning. I remember when I was a kid, bro, I wrote this in my preface as well in the book. I was like, I think I was 11 or 12. I had this existential crisis. Like I realized I was really lonely. Mm. Like literally, like I wasn't, it really bothered me that I wasn't conscious about other people's conscious experiences, the people that I loved. Like I might engage with them for a while, like say at school or at home. But the minute I go into the bath and I would just sit in the bath, I realized I'm not aware of their conscious reality at the moment. And that made me even question whether, not they were real or not. I know this is a form of solipsism, but the point I'm trying to say is it was a really, really lonely experience. The point I would cry. Mm. I would literally cry. I would feel extremely lonely, right? And the, I think the only way I dealt with that is by, from what I remember, is just searching for things that were meaningful. Because when things are meaningful, they're more real. Mm-hmm. And I think that was one of the driving forces for me to find the truth about reality. Because when something is true, it's meaningful by, you know, by definition. And that's what helped me search for Islam, the truth, because it was meaningful. Not only, it wasn't meaningful in some kind of, I'm going to make up meaning for myself, but rather it was true and meaningful. Mm-hmm. And that for me was really, really profound. Um, and so that shaped me a lot. That shaped me a lot. That kind of ex- that was that was that was an experience that shaped me a hell of a lot. So, and I think that basically drove me to search meaning in things. How did I get here again? See, I always do this. I always do this. It's been a long day. It's, I do apologize to the viewers. It's been a long day. I've been filming for most of the day, <laughs> so wonderful. I'm just going on tangents so, and, and no, rants. This is, and, this is good. So <laughs> I've got I've got two more points. Right. No just problem. One thing is. Um, so one of the things people love about you, mashallah, again, is your language, is your referencing, your academic style. What's with all this kind of language? Like, you know, a lot of people would hear your words and they'll be like, it sounds wonderful. I love what he's saying. I love that he's talking for Islam, but I don't really get it all, right? So tell well, me about some of these yeah. big words, glossary. Yeah, danger. sure. I think a lot of it's changed now. So in actual mm-hmm. fact, I, you know, I think other brothers now, like Muhammad <laughs> Hijab, and uh, Sabor, they, they, I think they're more complicated than me yeah. sometimes, right? So I think I've learned as a result of writing the book, because my audience was first, second year students, mm. I tried to break it down as much as possible. If I did use a word, I explained the principle and the concepts. So I have tried to change. But I think it's very powerful bro, because words are vehicles to meaning, right? Mm. And people attach meaning to certain words, obviously. So take, for example, and that's where the art of Tao is the art of changing language. Because okay. take, for example, the word fear. In a post-secular context, fear is you're scared of an enemy, right? Mm. So when you say fear of Allah, subconsciously, many secular people don't have a religious background. They, they think that you're scared of Allah like an enemy. But that's not the kind of fear of Allah that you should have in the Islamic tradition, mm. right? Because Allah is not an enemy, right? 
Do you see the point? Yeah. So, you know, the type of fear, like I, I like to describe it is like, say you're walking in a mall or in a, in, in a shopping center and you see this mother tending off a child and the child is holding onto the leg of the mother saying, sorry, sorry. She's fearful of loss of connection. She's fearful of the consequences of that loss of connection. Wow. Yeah. That's the type of fear that we're talking about, generally speaking. Obviously, we should have this awe of Allah in terms of his majesty, but you don't fear Allah like he's your enemy, right? Mm. But people, like especially in the Greek language, when you say, you know, uh, now for don't say, oh, yeah, to be scared of God, it means, oh my God, you should be scared of him. He's going to destroy you kind of thing. And he's going to send you to hell. Mm. Yes, we believe in hell for sure. But we also know in Islam that Allah doesn't want you to go to hell. Because mm. Allah says in the Quran, he prefers belief for his servants. If you look at yeah. the Mufassirin, the exegetes of Islam, they basically said that Allah doesn't want, he wants goodness for you. He wants guidance for you. That's the whole point of the Quran, right? Mm. So it's a very nuanced theology. So I don't like using... Uh, that word much uh, you probably don't hear me see use that word much in public discourse i would use god consciousness or mindfulness mm. of god and if i do use the word i'll try and define it so like what like i did in my book mm. so now that's not only the reason why i use words by the way sometimes it's just because you're in a kind of academ academic yeah. cultural environment it just happens mm. to, 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 to use it that way but the, you should have a strategy for your language you should use particular words like, for example, Ar-Rahman, I don't really, I try not to translate it as the merciful. I translate it as the intensely merciful. Mm. Because Ar-Rahman comes from, it means three major things. That Allah's mercy is a boiling over mercy. It's a very intense mercy. Allah's mercy is an immediate mercy. And Allah's mercy is so powerful that nothing can stop. And that's a different, that's what it means. Mm. Now, just saying the merciful in an English language, people's connotation to that means, oh, he's compassionate, he's kind or something. But it's more than that. And I think we have a job especially in the da'wah, to change our language. Like, take, mm. for example, prayer. I try not to use the word prayer in certain contexts. Because when people mean prayer, they think, supplication, I'm going to ask something. But is salah just asking something? Salah is bigger than that. Mm. Salah, the prayer five times a day that we do, is a supplication. It's a dhikr. It's a hamd. It's being grateful. It's a movement. It's a sound. It's a connection. It's a divine conversation. It's all of these amazing things. How can you reduce it to that word? Because words are vehicles to meaning. And the art of doubt, bro, is trying to change our language. And, and I think Amazing. one scholar that tried to do that uh, is, for example, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. He's tried to, and I actually got this point from him in one of mm. his videos, which is a very important point, is that you need to try and change the language, right? I remember one scholar said to me, oh, you think all these old guys were wrong in using this language? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I'm not saying that in an arrogant way. He's like, yeah. they picked a Christian language, a post-secular language, mm. and they... It, and they superimpose it on the Quranic discourse, on the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is frankly, we should choose the most appropriate words that are connected to the Islamic meanings. And those mm. meanings are profound. Fine, you won't get it perfect, but let's try our best. Do you see? Amazing. So one of the reasons is that, it's not the only reason. The other reason is as a strategy to uplift and empower uh, us and to show that Islam can be intellectual and rational at the same mm. time and it Wonderful, has a powerful yeah. position. Uh, unfortunately, maybe in the past, some of it was showing off. May Allah forgive me. Um, but yeah, bro. That's so, wonderful. What no, no, I, you know, what? I'm really glad I asked you that now because what you're saying is so true. It's all about the communication and the words that you use, and it can get you two different results. You know, absolutely. So, so it's like for amazing. example, if I if I said you had to change, or you had to transform, wink, mm. wink. Yeah, yeah. We, we know what this means. <laughs> yeah. You know. Anyway, the point is. What would you rather choose? Mm. I'd rather use transform. It yeah. sounds less painful. <laughs> sure, exactly. Yeah, it, 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 it's less, less painful. So, yeah, so language Amazing. is very important. And you know what? It makes me realize, you know, that hadith that talk about your tongue. Mm -hmm. And because of your tongue, you'd be thrown into the hellfire. Because, you know, the words are heavy, bro. Yeah. Words are heavy. Spe uh, speak good or remain silent, yeah? We're not conscious sometimes even the words that we use. And, I, and me too. I talk a hell of a lot sometimes and I waffle. Proof is today, yeah? And sometimes I go on tangents that are not even connected and I don't even make sense, especially when I'm tired, like today. So, you see, I've put the excuse in there. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. But the, but the point is, Habibi, is that we need to be very careful the way you use language. And Dao is such a... Dao is much bigger than you. You're calling people to reconnect to Allah. You're saying to humanity that your purpose in life is to, to know Allah, to love Allah, to obey Allah, and to be humble before Him, and to direct all internal and external acts of worship to Allah alone. That's ibadah. That's worship. Mm. That's higher than anything you can imagine. Choose your language carefully, right? Choose it carefully. How dare we, you know, just be so random with the language that we use? 
we should be very careful with the language that we use, you know. And uh, high standards yes. even in language, mashallah. Absolutely, Amazing. we have to. Okay, great. So one thing I wanted to focus on, bro, is that leadership. I think Aira is showing a lot of leadership, mashallah. Like in the outside, I know you guys have done uh, things like you know how to run a good charity in terms of like all the compliance and all these things you've been helping other charities to do it the kind of way that you're doing fundraising and all this stuff really really amazing right but one of the things that really stands out for people are your videos right yeah, people yeah. love your videos you just released one recently where it was like a tense scene between you and Abdul Rahim. really really amazing videos right mashallah again leadership like standing out tell us a little bit about the videos like what's the thinking that goes on how do you do this stuff well, you know what? I was thinking a lot about marketing. And, you know, as I said, I try and manage by exceptions. If there's any gaps where I think something is not to the current standard, I would actually really think about it. So I felt that videos, we're, we're in an age of, 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 of visuals, right? Mm. People don't read reports anymore. I mean, who's going to read a, a yearly report with all your stats? I mean, yeah. not many people in the grand cosmic scheme of things, right? So I said, we live in a video age and we need something, which I think I learned from you. We need purple cows, bro. Mm. Everyone's going to notice the purple cow. So I said, we need to create purple cows. And for me, I think I see myself as quite intuitive. And if I see something, I know if it's going to work or not, or I know it's, it's, it's pulling my heartstrings. And I felt that maybe some of our videos were just too informative, the same kind of background <laughs> sounds, yeah. the same. It was just boring. I'm not going to watch this yet. I want, something has to really stand out. And we can do it. And to be honest, if you said to me, this is going to be the product, I'll probably not believe you. But I just had trust in the process, trust in ourselves, trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hopefully, inshallah. So for one of the videos, I just was bright spotting, which is another thing that you taught us, bro. Just look up what's great. So mm-hmm. I'll sit there with my oats and my peanut butter and bananas and blueberries. And in the morning, I'll be just watching, I'll be watching stuff on Gordon Ramsay. I was watching kitchen stuff. I was watching some Chinese film. I was watching all good adverts and I was trying to think, what's going to stand out? Mm. You know, how we can get all the information in the way that people are going to see at least a three or four minute video and still stay tuned and uh, how is it going to stand out? So I was thinking all these things. So we developed the kitchen video, for example, yeah, which was amazing. very popular. Um, and then after we created a marketing steering group with media productions, with a marketing specialist, with um, uh, one of our designers, videographers, and with um, our IT guru. Obeda, right? Mm-hmm. And we said, right, let's sit together and start thinking about a script. And it's about giving people the freedom, getting the right people that work well together because culture is very important. G- give you some of the right behaviors and the wrong skills, but the right skills and the wrong behaviors, I'll pick some of the right behaviors because you can mm-hmm. gain a new skill, bro, yep. but sometimes it's very hard to get a behavior. So culture is very important. So you create the, the right type of culture and connection between people to create good scripts. So uh, for the kitchen one, I did it myself, right? Hmm. But they did something even better, right? So they did the heat scene, the one that you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they did a scene, and all I did, I had to do a few tweaks or mention something just to slightly, maybe not improve it, but just make some adjustments. And I got someone who's involved in the media, and he said this was the best video he's seen in the West concerning a marketing a DAO organization. Wow. Yeah? And I was like, wow, that's, that's, that's quite good. Amazing. Um, now, the thing is, we always want to improve. So the next video that's coming yeah. out is the, is the 12 months video. Now, what I did, the what? what I've done, the, is the 12 months video, meaning our okay. operation year is from 1st of July to end of June. Right. So in July, we're going we're gonna to produce and release a what 12, month, 12 right. months update. Yep. So it has to be even better than the heat scene. It has to be better than the kitchen, right? Mm. Kitchen video. So... How are we going to do that? I don't know. But what I've done is create a competition. So I told the marketing steering group, I said, listen, here's a competition. I've announced it to the team. Me against you. Oh, right? wow. Okay, great. Yeah. I like so, it. Because, you know, we both enjoy scripts. We both yep. done good scripts as well before. I did the kitchen. They did the heat scene. Yep. Now let's compete with each other. <clears throat> and I said, whoever's one is better, we do it. But if they're both relatively the same, we'll adjust one to be one just to promote the DAO in general. And one will be specifically for the 12 months. So we could get, you know, two things out of this. Yeah. So we're currently in the process. The deadline's this Friday. The marketing steering group have almost completed. 
And to be honest, yeah, <laughs> I haven't done anything properly yet. Yeah, <laughs> I still need good at bro. I might actually call you. We may have to brainstorm. Yeah, let's yeah. do that. Because because I didn't say that I'm not allowed to use anyone outside the organization. Yeah. yeah. So, but I don't even see you outside the organization anyway. But you know yeah. what I mean, yeah. So we need to sit and talk, bro. Because I want to beat them. <laughs> you know what? I actually I actually thought that the um, kitchen script was much better than the heat thing. I think really? the heat. Yeah, I thought the heat scene was amazingly filmed. I thought the way it was done, the acting, all of that was amazing. But I felt the script wasn't as good as the kitchen one. That's what I thought. In fairness, the script for the heat scene was very good. But I tell you what happened: me and Green had to do so many retakes, and we didn't we didn't memorize our lines. Oh yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, <laughs> and that's why. Right. So okay. in fairness to them, me and Green messed up the script. Okay, yeah, but the script was actually good. But in terms of the puns and the and the informative nature. Because it was a six months update for the whole organization, it would have been a bit more informative, a bit yeah. more funnier, maybe. But because this was just for the UK update, mm-hmm. I think the objectives were met. That okay, something's happening UK. Yeah, it's very great interesting. Work. It was yeah. very interesting, man. Subhanallah. great video. Yeah, yeah. Okay, bro. So tell me, um, like some books, resources that you recommend for leaders, for like you know all the kind of things we've been talking about. Any books? Any recommendations of what leaders should do to try and develop themselves a bit further? Bro, you know what? You won't believe me here. Yeah? Honestly, you won't believe me. I'm not saying I follow this school of thought, but I do believe reading books are very powerful. But I got to admit, I probably haven't read a book on leadership properly. Okay, interesting. Honestly, bro. Um, okay, I've been listening to Ego is the Enemy, which is very powerful. Um, and that's like a leadership book, in mm. essence. I think that's very important if anyone wants to read that. So I would recommend that. But for me, bro, the greatest book that sometimes we don't read are other people's experiences and your experiences. Mm. Because what is a book? It's people's experiences on ink and paper. But I think you could read far more books by interacting with people. Like, for example, I learned more from you, bro, than I could learn from a book. And that's Mm. because we had experiences together. And you read from your own book if Mm. you're conscientious or if you have that self-awareness. So true. And, And honestly, bro, because what difference is there between a book... And you engaging with someone in the same way. You probably get more, you probably learn from a, from a person that you would never learn from a book. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's why for me, I'm not saying I'm against it because it works for people. But I truly believe that we should seek more experiences, more transformative experiences, more experiences with other people by asking questions, seeing how they work, looking into your own failures and experiences, be, being conscientious and reading it and trying to find the correct solutions and find the answers on how you could have done something better to create, to become a better leader. Um, and I think you learn a hell of a lot from that. So I've learned a lot from Abdurrahim Green. I've learned a lot from you. I've learned a lot from brothers who are not even like what you call official leaders. Mm. And that is something very powerful. Learn, no one's beneath you and no action is beneath you. Like for example, Kamran, who used to be our CEO a few years ago, bro, he would clean the toilet when he had about five minutes spare. Mm. Come on, man. I have not seen any CEO to date clean no. the toilet, right? You know, and I've learned, I learned something about, uh, I learned uh, vision and strategy from, from Saqib. You know, vision, where you want to see yourself. What's your strategic focus? The core actions or the core things that you need to do mm. that you believe are essential to fulfill your vision. <laughs> and I've helped other organi- another organization do the same exercise. I didn't read a book on it. It was through experience, through reflection, through engaging with leaders in their own right. Even maybe listening to stuff, podcasts are a really good way, you know, because mm. lived experiences come through podcasts. But yeah, so I, I'm not the one that would say, because look, if you think about it, you know, you could be a leader and write, you know, the, the 15 ways on how to be a great leader. Now, the thing is, what book did he read? <laughs> Some of them, yeah. like, for example, have they read a book? Like, you have leadership books on Malcolm X. Leadership books on the Prophet Sallallahu oh, Alaihi Wasallam. Yeah. What books did they read, bro? You see, mm. so I want to go to the core. I think the book is secondary. What's the Very core? Good. I think the core is for many of these people is they were conscientious. They had lived experience that reflected upon, and they they had true reflection to find out how they can improve. And they saw those experiences in others, and they engaged with others to get the best out of other people. And you know what, bro? That's exactly the reason why we do this show. Allah <laughs> akbar. There you Fantastic. go. But that's but that's it, bro. And I'm telling you, what we've said now in an hour and twenty four minutes and thirteen seconds. Is what they could probably not they they, they could they they would probably capture in ten hours reading a book. Yeah, so true. Honestly, bro. So this, so so this whole process um, is is phenomenal. So I think people should do that absolutely and always be open. Nothing's beneath you. No one's beneath you. You're always learning from people. So 
Alhamdulillah. What's one question I should have asked you that I haven't asked you? That's a good question, man. What is one question that you should have asked me, but you didn't ask me? I don't know. From a leadership point of view, maybe... Or what do you want to share with us that maybe as your last thing before we close? Well, I think from a leadership in a charity context, hmm. I think we, well, even just generally as leadership, I follow a principle which maybe wasn't followed before, generally speaking, as an organization, which is give and you will get back. A lot of people think that they have this false notion of competition. They basically think that, okay, we need to restrict this. We, we shouldn't give people this information. We should strategize. And even in the charity sector, it's a bit of a mafia, unfortunately. Like I have someone in the media and people call him to try and, you know, they're from a charity. He's like, okay, oh, check this charity. Is it true what they're really saying? It's really, mm. really shallow. I think, I think what has given us a lot of barakah as well as an organization is his giving. So we've given to organizations that people don't know about. Like we've given them processes for free. We've given them thousands of pounds worth of work mm. in order for them to become more robust. We've even given them fundraising stuff. <laughs> and people don't even know because, look, at the end of the day, you know, don't secularize your strategies. You know, we think if you do A, B, and C, it's going to happen. No, it's, Allah's going to make it happen. You just have to do the right thing. And, you know, take, for example, fundraising. If someone asks you, can we borrow your fundraising manager? What would many CEOs say? Let's be honest, bro. They would slap them. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But we've tried, hopefully, in certain contexts, and we've given a lot of information away. Why? I learned this from Fadl Suleiman, by the way. He said, this is a spiritual disease. Because if you think that you won't get the bounty from Allah, you've just restricted the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh, yeah. You just restricted it. And I remember the first time or the second year that we're going into fundraising, there was an organization that I can't name that wanted fundraising help. And we were, and I think I a lot of our collective initial reaction was saturation, this, that, and the other. Mm. Obviously, you know, there are physical asbab causes Allah puts in place. There are bound barriers yeah. to things for sure. But in the grand cosmic scheme of things, especially when it came to this organization, which was not related to our specific work, I was like, no, bro, Allah is bountiful. Because if you think that we won't get bounty from Allah, you've just restricted his bounty. You're saying that his bounty is not enough for us and for them. This doesn't make sense in a secular paradigm, yeah. bro. But I'm telling you, when you follow it, Baraka comes. Like even this year, we blurred a lot of our videos. It doesn't look good. But we realize, oh my God, we've sometimes we've accidentally, we wasn't really conscious that we've allowed our Shahada videos, some of the women, to basically... Uh, we filmed the way that they are and in the in you know some yeah. areas of the world it wasn't you know didn't look great from an islamic ethical point of view so mm -hmm. we felt oh my god these women would be would probably change their attire in the future and they'll probably not want these videos to come out so we bled them and you know what we've done the best this year that we've done any other year Amazing. yeah in terms of results um, in terms of the incoming And I think that's because of Baraka bro mm. So I, I love so, that. The, so, yeah. so the point is this Stick to your principles mm. And stick to your spiritual world view You know don't think that you have to You know sacrifice and compromise And think that Oh but if we do this it's going to happen And strategize These things are not going to happen You know what You may achieve your goal But you probably lost what was coming to you mm. Yeah it's like and gambling I isn't it like You may become a millionaire mm. from gambling bro you would have become a millionaire anyway. Do you see the point? Because yeah. your risk is set. Yeah. Do you see the point? So you can't steal a million pounds and that's the risk from Allah. It was already planned. But you chose the halal, the haram means. Hmm. But you would have got that million pounds anyway if you chose the halal means. Do you see the True. point? Yeah. So stick to your principles and barakah will come. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm telling you, if, if more people do this, it, it will be fantastic. And I think a lot of now small to medium charities... Uh, people come from my generation and the leading charities, even mm. humanitarian charities, they're thinking like this now. They're joining together. Others want to, uh, they are, there are humanitarian charities that want to help IERA with the humanitarian side of DAO because that's not a strategic focus. So when we do DAO, they could do the humanitarian yeah. side. You know, now people are thinking in that way, bro. And that's because I think people are more connected to the kind of the Akhira, yeah, the investors in Akhira. And also they're more connected to Islam in that way. Mm. As I think sometimes the old school mentality of, you know, you know, follow these secularized paradigm, the, the, the secular paradigms for success. 
you know, there's some good in them for sure because there are patterns that Allah gives us in the universe that we have to follow. But I believe we add our tradition as well. It would just go right up there, bro. Because think about it, bro. Think about this. The greatest calamity for the ummah was the death of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is this is an ijma'ah of the ulama. Mm. The greatest calamity. You think we got troubles now? That was the greatest calamity. So everything after his death, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is positive, yeah. right? Yeah. From in the grand cosmic scheme of things. Eighty years after his death, we were in Pakistan in Multan, and we were in Spain spreading the peace and mercy and justice of Islam. But it was eighty-two years after his death, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That the Muslims decided to fix the masjid of the Prophet because it was still dripping, leak, leaking of water. Oh, wow. So they, their vision was building people, not building instu- not building buildings. Yeah, it's not the pestle and mortar, right? That they wanted to build the individual, right? Um, and this may not link generally to what we're saying, but there was another point I wanted to raise was, and it's totally escaped me, Habibi. But we were talking about just a few seconds ago before I mentioned this. Buildings and people and giving. Before that, just before that. Yeah, giving and you're getting back. Um, SubhanAllah, I forgot. I'm tired, bro. I do apologize. I do apologize. But anyway, that was a good point anyway. The point yeah. is, you know, we need to stick to our principles. And mm. when you stick to the pr- principles, the you know, Allah. Oh, that, this is the point. Look, this Sahaba, bro. You give me... A secular paradigm for the success of the Sahaba. I think it was Carol Hillenbrand. She was a historian. I think that's her name. She said this is like almost impossible what happened in, mm. in, in the Islamic community. Yeah. You had the equivalent, equivalent of a village in Oldham. <laughs> yeah, it's true. An equivalent yeah. of a village in Greater Manchester. Yeah. One man, one book with sticks. And they took over Europe. You put that. Through the paradigm of your secular strategies, bruv. Mm. <laughs> you know, to Same. be colloquial with you. Yeah. Do you see my point? So don't get me wrong. There are patterns in the universe that we need to follow. But how do you know that's everything? Because what are patterns in the universe, bro? They're just inductive inferences. They're based on our limited data. Hmm. There may be things that we don't, we're not seeing. They're just patterns we perceive. There may be other patterns that we're not aware of. Or there may be a change to the pattern that we haven't observed. So add wahi, your principle, ethical principles. And if you stick to them... That's where success is, bro. Allah talks about who the successful ones are, right? So stick to that paradigm as well. Yes, observe the patterns. You know, the universe itself and what's in within the universe is a book for you to read as well. But also read the book of Allah and the sunnah and you see, stick to these principles, give and you get back, right? Stick to your ethics and you'll get barakah. Because what is barakah, bro? It's not even, it's, you can't even put it in mathematics. One mm. plus one is infinity. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. Baraka, right? Yeah. You can't put that into those terms. And you only understand this through lived experience. And I'm telling you, if people stick to this, charities stick to this, even Muslim businesses stick to this, I'm telling you, they'll get returns that they'll never imagine. And you know what? It might not even be monetary returns. It might be popularity. It might be just well-being in your own life, bro. Mm. It, might be that you, it might be that you could sleep at night, for God's sake. SubhanAllah. Yeah, bro, true. trust me, ask any billionaire. I'll give you 10 billion or I'll give you the ability to sleep at night. And I'm telling you, They'll give all their money to sleep at night. Yeah? Or even health. Hmm. So, you know, it's about how you see things as well. So the thing is, you know, it could be, bro, what we're doing in our era means our era closes down. For some reason. Say because we're naive. Say you could call it, you're just naive. You're going to close down, you won't have any money. I don't see that as a negative. Because what is our era? It's just a vehicle for the dawah. Yeah. There's no intrinsic value in our era. Its value only is because of its vision. So it could be the IR closes down and because we've supported so many different organizations behind the scenes and they've grown so big, they now acquire all of our staff and they basically double our capacity by adding more staff. Mm. So who was truly successful, my friend? Because people conflate the vehicle with the vision and that's the biggest problem. Mm. The vision is always greater than the vehicle. It's amazing. Zakhla Khairo, wonderful, hi, wonderful. Hi, baby. I love, I love that. It's been absolutely amazing, bro. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Likewise, man. I bless you, bro. Zakhla Khair for all your time, all the wonderful advice. It's, I'm really glad because um, there's some things you've answered for me, which I think I thought about. I never asked you, right? 
So that's really good. And I know everyone that's watching is going to love it and they're going to really, really like get lots of it. I'm going to cut it all up and share lots of these gems exactly that you like shared, bro. man. And you played your part, bro, in other people becoming great leaders, great CEOs. Alhamdulillah. Uh, Brothers and sisters, this is the Muslim CEO podcast show. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, if you haven't already, please go to muslimceo.com. Check out the free training there. Subscribe to us. Hamza, once again, Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much. And inshallah, we'll catch up soon. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.